And I'd like to, to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Rob Steinmetz. Steinmetz, yeah. Steinmetz yeah. Um, to the, the group. And so uh, we distributed all of his uh, biography and uh, resume and Vita information earlier online, and so that's available. Hopefully folks had an opportunity to review that. Uh, you should have received a survey when you came in. And so one of the things that we were doing is we're compiling all the survey information. So at the end of the, uh, the uh, talk, if you would complete that, uh, and we'll collect that, and Jenny will compile uh, our feedback as an institution. Uh, Lynn Liam, who is our uh, representative on the, the Regional Advisory uh, Committee for the search. With Linda. With Linda and, and Margaret. Uh, uh, Margaret. But she'll be representing us, I think, on Thursday, where there'll be a discussion about all of the candidates that we've been able to see. So we want to make sure that, that we uh, have that feedback. And, uh, this is being taped for individuals that aren't uh, uh, able to be here physically. And then the other thing that we'll ask, because it's being taped, if you do have a question, we ask that you could uh, go to one of the microphones on either side and ask the question. Last night we had a little bit of difficulty with picking up the, uh, the uh, individuals asking questions. So if you could uh, answer, uh, ask your question directly into the mic, we'd, we'd appreciate that. Uh, and so without further ado, we'd like to introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. For me, this is stop four of five, so I'm really excited and happy to be here and have been now uh, worn in to be an expert and uh, from the other questions I've received at the other colleges to, to hopefully be able to have some additional context as I've learned throughout the day to provide um, some even more kind of well-rounded responses to what I'm sure are one, shared concerns across these five colleges and two, very specific individual and different concerns for this college. For me, I'll talk a little bit about my background. Um, so I uh, started out as a community college student myself. I come from uh, a working class family, a first generation student, and I didn't uh, really enjoy high school, to be honest. So I was kind of, because of that, an average student and didn't have a plan at all as I graduated high school for what I would do next. And um, that was in South Florida, and then I moved with my mother up to Tennessee, and I um, just saw the green sign on the side of the road for the community college that was there, and for some reason motivated myself to go and to apply, having no idea what that meant or you know, what I would be getting into. And my first semester just went right for me. I, um, got a call to be a tutor in the math center. I had that English teacher that just really lit a fire in me for reading and writing, which was an area that I had always not enjoyed all that much because I was more of a math person. And um, got involved in student life stuff and some clubs and organizations. And finished you know, with straight A's my first term and then the way that I am, I didn't want to lose that and was really passionately ready to continue my education after that first semester. And uh, little did my high school faculty know, because I still say they'd be pretty shocked, that then I went on, based on that experience, to go on to get the bachelor's and a master's and then ultimately my doctorate, um, all then focusing on how to support other students to be able to have the experience that I had and to be able to be successful at community colleges. And so that's really what I've dedicated my academic work to when I did that and my career to now around 20 years working as an administrator at community colleges. Um, so a little bit about that, I started at the college that I went to and was student life and orientation coordinator and then moved on to be the recruitment, retention and enrollment services and management director. Um, and that began a road of kind of starting to become an enrollment manager and get more heavily involved in the kind of college-wide work overall. Then I moved to another institution where I became the Associate Dean of Enrollment Management and was also the College Registrar, where I learned a great deal about uh, a large number of things, including curricular design as well as just how to manage a complex system at a community college. Uh, and started to just expand my work in general in leadership and support for students. Then I went to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where for seven years I was the vice president for student affairs and enrollment management there. And during that time, 
I uh, really had a similar experience to a lot of what we're talking about today with um, the idea of regionalization. So that institution had five campuses. They were singly accredited and uh, had about 18,000 students. And so um, if you combine the five colleges that I'm talking to today in Connecticut, as of fall 18, it was 17,604, I believe, um, students that are represented from a headcount perspective throughout that area. In addition, there was a need at that institution, and then finally right now I'm at Portland Community College in Portland, Oregon, where there are four campuses and around 27,000 students for a fall term headcount unduplicated. And I, um, in both of those experiences, have worked on college-wide efforts to be able to look at how to support each of the campuses in that case and how we look at making sure that there is not this idea of only having a centralized model where folks are not being provided with proper support from a faculty and staff perspective and service and support from a student perspective, um, that we look at a balance on having a continued independent culture and difference and an acknowledgement of specific needs for each specific campus in that case and looking at what we can do related to creating a better environment for students through efficiencies and through some centralization of services. And so that's why I'm standing in front of you today. I was actually excited by the vision that was being set forth that would focus more on looking at how to create efficiencies instead of looking at how to eliminate colleges or how to reduce faculty lines or academic program areas or frontline direct service. And I know there's a lot of questions and, and controversy about that and I'm not here to be the advocate for the Students First initiative, but I am saying that, that I don't need to apply to go somewhere else. This was of interest to me because it seemed like a visionary and innovative way to solve a problem that most community colleges throughout the country are dealing with right now, which is how to be sustainable with lower and lower support from the state and with continued enrollment declines. Uh, and the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to questions is a statistic about that, that it's estimated in Connecticut that um, you'll see another 7% in high school graduates over the course of the next, next decade. And I saw another statistic that in 20 years it could be as high as 31%. And um, the fun fact that sticks with me about that, not so fun really, is that that changed, those projections changed, guess when they changed? In 2008 when the Great Recession hit, fewer people had babies. So that means 18 to 20 years after that, you're going to see fewer graduation rates, right? And so you know you have a slightly shrinking population. There are opportunities looking at programs and looking at the adult student population that certainly are things that um, are of interest, but ultimately we have to figure out how we can sustain ourselves in the long term to be here in 50 years to continue to maximize access for students going into community colleges and higher education. So with that, I would love to answer any questions you might have. Great, have a great day, thank you. <laughs> We're done. The first question's always the slowest. I'm Jeff Partridge, the chair of the Humanities Department. I have to apologize, I have a, a meeting in 10 minutes I have to leave for. Uh, but I guess uh, a question that, that comes to mind, this is not a student first question, you said you're not you know, uh, uh, defending or, or, or a spokesperson for that. But uh, one of the perceptions that is throughout our system is that, uh, that we, the students, students first initiative is putting in a lot of layers of administration, including what you're uh, uh, interviewing for. So I would like to know your perception, your, your, your perspective on that, and also how you would manage uh, the, the kind of perspectives that are out there. 
Yeah, I think I thank you for the question. It's it's a, a vital question that I think has to be answered as part of the work of both hiring these positions and if I were to be lucky enough to receive it on starting to manage how to change the perception and expectation of the position that I would be in. So I would say, one, my perception is that um, I, I don't see it as an additional unneeded layer. I see it as a level of leadership that one, can largely be a translator between what's happening at the state level and what's happening at the colleges. And so um, the CEOs, presidents, and campus leaders are all doing a great job. I, again, I'm getting what I can from all of my review of all the websites and the news stories and those sorts of things. But it's clear that there's really strong support and advocacy at all of the colleges. And the work that I would be doing would be looking at how to, one, make sure that I was a strong advocate for all five of the colleges that I would represent, and making sure that I was connected enough to each of the colleges to be able to provide that information, that I was engaged enough to be able to truly hear and understand what the concerns are, what the questions are, and, and take that as an advocate to the statewide offices in those conversations, and also provide an opportunity for explaining the why and the true plans behind what's happening in the statewide offices. So I think that there have been a lot of attempts to do that, and I've seen some communications that I thought actually were really phenomenal and helped solidify for me more details about the plan, So though I still feel kind of just have the scaffolding. But that's very different from you having a relationship with someone that's going to be able to talk to you. And the capacity for you know, the statewide president to do that is probably not realistic, but it would be my top priority to truly have that engagement at each of the colleges and in the community to be that kind of translator and to also be that person who is strongly advocating every day for each of the colleges, both what the whole region is saying they need, but also what each individual college is saying they need. So that's how I would kind of frame how I think of the position and how I think I would begin to work within it to be able to start to better communicate exactly what benefit the position, quite frankly, could have for the colleges. I hope that answers the question. I have several questions, but okay. I'll start with one for now. Okay. And uh, we'll go from there. What involvement do you see having with our students? Yeah, I see myself being significantly involved in an appropriate way. And so I don't think that this position should get involved in the details of implementing every plan at a college, but I would want to know the student leaders at each of the colleges. I would want to have opportunities to be able to meet with them on a regular basis to understand from a regional perspective what it is that I can do to help support them. Um, in addition, I always do focus groups. So I would do, want to do focus groups on a fairly regular basis to understand beyond the student leaders what the experience of our students are and be able to really work collaboratively with uh, all of the leadership at the institution on understanding how I can appropriately engage with students. But um, I was a student leader. I was the SGA treasurer and the chair of our programming board when I was a student. Um, and uh, my first job, as I said, was, was student activities and orientation. And so the other thing is for my own happiness, I have to have that real engagement with students and believe that there's a real positive in, in taking time to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a feeling you're going to sit down and get right back up. Oh, no, I see a couple more movement. I see a little bit of movement. <laughs> uh, my name is Cheryl Lee. I'm from the nursing department. Uh, you spoke of the program that you're currently with in Oregon and that this it's regionalized and I like what you've said so far. But I'm curious, given that 
you're coming into a contentious situation because this isn't a real popular move among the faculty and the colleges. We prefer to keep the system as is and find ways to work within it rather than adding the layers of administration as we see as, as a more cost when we don't have the funds to begin with. So we have some issues for it and you're going to be stepping into this but I'm curious with this situation and the fact that you do have a similar position, why come here? What is what makes you think that this is a good move for you? Yeah, thank you. I would say that it's a little bit of what I said in my opening remarks, which is that my current institution as well is struggling to balance the budget and trying to figure out what steps we need to take in order to make that happen. And uh, we're, we're doing that work within constraints and limitations just like uh, just like exists here in Connecticut. And what I was really drawn to was the idea, and it, not in the short term, right? And that's been acknowledged, that in the short term, we're not talking about masses, massive savings based on these changes. But in the long term, through creating um, a system that can allow for greater collaboration, greater ease, for example, of transfer of students between the colleges, uh, and looking at the ability to really bring together uh, a conversation around creating more efficient systems and processes while balancing that with continuing to support college culture really is a positive vision for how, in the long term, the institution can be sustained and all of the colleges can be sustained. And a couple of things I'll say is that the idea that we don't think the communities around us can change to a point where we are no longer sustainable is a mistake. And the idea that right now is not an urgent situation in this, in this state and in community colleges across the country, I would suggest is also a mistake. That there has to be global, large-scale vision and change in order to ensure that we are here 50 years from now. Um, you know, a, a couple of examples. Merrill Hurst in Oregon, where I am, is a private liberal arts college. It was here for 120 years. And last year, they just had to shut their doors. And they had to close down. And they didn't think it was an emergency. They didn't think it was an emergency by the time Literally, there was no longer an ability to pay the bills and keep the lights on. Then they suddenly tried to do all of these short-term strategies that just weren't going to work because it takes time to make sure we're making proper adjustments that are strategically sound. And so that's why I was drawn to the opportunity that this focus on looking at in the long term actually creating a more efficient and a flatter um, administrative structure and really continuing to focus on keeping colleges open and again, not impacting faculty, academic programs, and frontline staff is really exciting. And um, I even know here, you know, that's one of the uh, few things I've garnered is that normally that has been the, the battle cry, right? That, you know, we've got so many administrators, things are so, so bloated and overblown. But while my position is new, the long-term plan is that it will be an overall reduction in the administrative structure and the administrative cost and oversight. And uh, that, so I, um, I mean, you know, they're talking about, I think, is it 127 administrative positions in the long-term being reduced over the course of a number of years. And so, so that is the primary focus on how we can create um, some semblance of trying to balance the budget while also improving outcomes for students. Because I used this statistic earlier and so I want to really clarify it, is 20% of our students in Connecticut that graduate, which is a limited number, mind you, but 20% of them, we know based on their transcripts that they attended more than one of the community colleges in the state. And so the idea of ease of transfer with single accreditation is, um, I think, a, a great thing for students. It's not straightforward and it's not simple, um, but it's a great conversation to have 
related to where are the benefits for students. So that's what excited me. I get excited by complex challenges. Frankly, I don't mind conflict. I, I'm pretty laid back and come from a center of caring and trust and uh, hope that I receive that in return. And I'll be stepping into a very controversial position, but I'm still a whole human being. And where I'm coming from is to try to have compassion with everyone I work with, with a center of looking at the student and how we can help improve the outcomes and how we can help improve support for the students. So maybe too long of an answer, but once you get me going. Uh, and I, uh, but that's why, that's why it appealed to me. Lillian Martinez, I'm a faculty member. My question is, what are your goals for your first, and if you've received this position, your first 100 days, what goals do you foresee completing? Oh, 100 days. Uh, so a lot of my time will be spent listening, and listening deeply, uh, and trying to understand what really are the key issues that the colleges are facing and how I can then be a leader to help support what I'm hearing. And I do that through an iterative process. I, I want to think what I hear. I want to say back the themes that I think I'm hearing to ensure that that then aligns with what you're seeing and then talk about what we'll do about it. So there are a couple things going on. So one is I am going to quickly ensure that, that I understand very clearly what the plans are for strategic change that are already set in motion, that I'm going to step into and need to support, but also provide feedback and hear what folks are concerned about to be able to then be an advocate for the colleges to say, yeah, we're going to move forward with this. This vision makes sense, but have we thought about adjusting this? There's real concern about this part. Can we do more in-depth discussion to adjust the plan in these specific ways? Because we're hearing from students and, and staff and other stakeholders that um, this isn't going to make sense for this reason. This is why this doesn't make sense. And on the other side of that, to be able to explain the why behind the things that we're doing to also ensure that misperception or misinformation as much as possible is also dealt with when things do make sense to move forward. And that will be my primary mode of operation, both on students first and what's already being implemented, but for me, more importantly, what the colleges need in the long term to also begin to create new planning and new discussions. And again, working very closely with college leaders, working very closely with students and staff at the institutions to understand what that begins to look like. I don't think strategic planning is something you just put on the shelf. I think it's a living process because it's one of the few things that allows us all to see a clear vision and to be able to move forward. And so that is something I believe in. I do yearly short-term strategic plans and long-term strategic planning and do that through a process that is collaborative to ensure we're all understanding and are creating buy-in for that work. I think that would be my primary um, mode of operation, both in the colleges and also in all of the communities that um, all of the colleges serve. So I would expect that I would be spending time at events every evening uh, you know, at, at different areas to make sure that, that I'm properly supporting what's happening and I'm, I'm making the connections that will help ensure advocacy for all of the colleges. And again, I would want to work with college leadership to understand what makes sense, what things maybe that aren't currently being covered. For example, volunteering for nonprofits is something that absolutely I would want to do, but where are we not at right now that maybe I could fill the role um, of stepping into? And how do we work together to, to really just maximize what our opportunities are um, in the community as well as the conversations happening at the state and at the colleges? Hi, Stephen Taylor. I'm a member of the foundation here at Capitol. 
Um, as it relates to student retention and your many roles and responsibilities and experience in the past, what are some things that you did to decrease the percentage and what are some examples of the most popular reasons why folks don't continue and graduate? Great. Thank you for that question. There are uh, a large number of strategies that I've implemented that I believe are, are, have shown some success. I was saying on the, the way up here how impressed I have been in my research, particularly of capital, being and achieving the dream leader school for so many years and um, we're a part of achieving the dream and I'm co-chairing our effort at my current institution, which includes building a lot of strategies. We're calling it Yes to Equitable Student Success, or YES for short. And uh, I co-chair that with the Chief Academic Affairs Officer and really have done um, a lot of work related to thinking about how to support students. So I'll start with the second part of your question and then kind of how we're addressing that. So why students leave is a good question. Uh, every time they're actually, and we've all done it, we do surveys of students who didn't succeed. You're always going to get, very rarely, was it the college? It was financial issues. It was a family emergency. It was that I had to go to work full time. And that then doesn't really give us information on what we can do to be able to intervene. So as I said, I, I dedicated my academic work to why students succeed or do not succeed at community colleges. And after all of that, I can then boil it down to one sentence, which I like. And that is, a student who knows someone by name at the institution is much more likely to succeed than a student who doesn't. And that's about student engagement. So the question is, when we say that, if I start to struggle, which we all did, right? We all struggled in our higher education career. We all had that emergency. We didn't have enough money to make it, make it work. And um, what then made us succeed when, when we do these surveys, that's the reason students say. And it's because you felt like you were part of a community. You felt like you belonged here. And that's the key. So all the strategies we talk about really goes back to that student engagement, both academic engagement and social engagement at the institution. I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that, that, um, that I've implemented um, and in the long term um, really has also been a positive evolution. So I don't know if any of you were at the Achieving the Dream National Conference this year, but it was really um, impressive that they're talking about what, what frankly I've been talking about for a decade, which is really around resources for students that goes far beyond what we're providing related tuition and fees and books. That nationally, statistics show 56% of our students at community colleges have gone to class hungry, not knowing where their next meal will come from in the last six months. 12% have been housing insecure and homeless. And think about, as we talk about all these complex strategies for success, if I'm a student and I go into a classroom and I don't know where my next meal is coming from and I haven't eaten today, how focused do you really think I'm going to be? So the conversation 10 years ago was, well, we can't do that. That's not our job. Well, the question is, if it's not our job, then whose job is it? And if we can play a role in helping to support how to address food and housing insecurity, then let's do what we can. Um, so some examples, I, we have, um, uh, we have food pantries at each of our campuses, and one campus in a month gave out 2,500 pounds of food to our students, just at one of them. But we also have to go beyond that. So we're looking at a plot of land that we have that we um, are willing to provide to build Section 8 housing. And they can then help provide spots for our students to get into that. We've also worked with the Department of Human Services on um, waiving some of the requirements for SNAP and TANF benefits. And so if a student works, uh, normally the requirement is a student has to work 20 hours in order to be eligible for food stamps. Well, we got a special dispensation that if they're attending our institution, they get that waived and they can still be eligible. So those are the sorts of kind of innovative things that you've got to think about as you're trying to address both student success overall and also success what I call the opportunity gap or the achievement gap 
related to traditionally underserved students, particularly low-income African-American and Hispanic students, and the disparate outcomes that we see in this state as well uh, on um, the success rates. Uh, and so the, the strategies related to that work is important, but we also have to look at college climate and folks feeling like they are a part of the institution. Because as I said, that's the fundamental. That if individuals don't see themselves in those that they're working with, that if individuals don't feel a part of and they experience microaggressions or out and out aggression, then they're not going to continue and are not going to be successful. So we have to look at climate and address that. And finally, you've just got to look at engagement strategies that are in the student's face. My last example that I'll provide is um, an, an, al an allegory, really, that if I, and I say I because this isn't great for me, if I go to the gym and have no idea what to do, um, and guess what? There are Olympians there to help me. And they're all in offices around the wall. And I, I don't know how to lift weights on a weight machine. Am I going to walk over to that office and knock on that door to ask that Olympian to help me with the most basic thing that I know they think is basic, but I have no idea how to do. Odds are I'm not going to do that. And it's the same thing a lot of times with students. You've got to think about how we can have proactive interventions with students to, in some cases, force that engagement. And the front line of that, for example, is advising. How are we doing our advising work? How are we making sure students are getting what they need when they need it? So I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. But I like that I get a little break in between each. It's nice. I'm used to rapid fire. I feel like they keep doing rock, paper, scissors on this side. That... Good afternoon, Linda Guzzo. Um, could you share your vision for workforce development and non-credit programming? Absolutely. Uh, so huge opportunity for growth and I know you know there's a lot of support that kind of floats in and out nationally and at the state level for uh, looking at workforce development uh, as kind of a whole a whole picture and in the long term looking at short-term training that will skill individuals up has to continue to be a key focus of the role that we play so one how do we understand and partner with business and industry in a way that allows us to meet the jobs that are needed in the future and anticipating that based on what's coming next. How do we look at the growth that right now there's a focus on in apprenticeships and opportunities to partner with folks related to apprenticeships? And boy, do some other countries have that right. Um, I had an opportunity to speak with someone from the embassy in Sweden. And Sweden, since the 80s, has been building really strong partnerships with business and industry to support ongoing work related to that. Now, business and industry actually pays for some of that, which is an interesting conversation to be had. But um, it allows for really strong apprenticeship programs because the business saw the value in the fact that they would get a guaranteed trained individual at the end of it. But there are some strong things like in Germany and, and in um, Switzerland, particularly that I recently looked at, and some strong examples within the states as well. So I think that's one piece, and I think partnering directly with business and industry on providing supports and services are also vitally important. You know, we also hear that soft skills is a huge component of what the future really holds, that we have to think about how to train our workforce students on soft skills and on how to think critically, because every couple of years the technology is going to change, so whatever we're training on today probably won't be applicable tomorrow. So we have to continue to think about how to center ourselves and how to continuously hear from business and industry to do that. And, and I've seen some of the things we're doing here, and it's really great that we are focusing in those ways. Um, but when you ask the question, those are my initial kind of fast responses about how I think of the importance of our workforce work and how we can continue to kind of expand and make sure we're ahead of the curve by continuing to partner in really strong ways with those who will ultimately employ those who are going to be going through that. And I don't know if community development is part of that. It varies by, by college, but um, yeah. And, uh, and I think that that's another important component. 
Um, and it just depends on where you're at as to whether or not I've seen other kind of nonprofits and others kind of taking on those opportunities versus where, again, are the specific opportunities that are available, but the long-term impact to the economy and the growth is probably really more on the workforce side. But we have to support them. I have a feeling you're up for question two. I don't know. I knew it. So this is the fourth of the fifth of five colleges that you'll be visiting today. Yeah. yeah. From the visits you've had so far, I'm sure you've seen a lot of differences between the campuses. Um, and it's clear that you're well studied on our state, our system, our students. So my question right now is I think you've been here today um, and have been exposed to a lot of different questions. What question or uh, anything that has stood out in your mind that you weren't expecting? Hmm. I wasn't expecting this one. Uh. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I think I anticipated most everything that has been asked. Um, I think perhaps what maybe has come out a little bit more strongly than I anticipated, though I completely anticipated the conversation, is um, kind of how the position would, well, let me say it this way, that there's a concern that the position would kind of lean everything towards complete regionalization or complete statewide kind of centralization. And for me, as I read about it and my experience, I know that, that that's not the case and that, that that wouldn't be a feasible way of creating something. That there is something here that is beneficial, but um, I think because you haven't experienced it, that, that it kind of, I think, goes to extremes um, in ways that I, I don't think one will happen, have been presented as happening, and in my experience, would be a way that could, could make it feasible. So I guess that that would be my response, is, is that I would see my role, as we talked about, as coming in to make sure that it's clearly understood what we want to do, what is and what isn't, and how we need to adjust expectations as well as the plan itself based on what the real needs are for the students in the colleges. Thank you. Yeah. You stumped me for a minute. Mm -hmm. You had a chance to walk around campus and take a look at our facilities? I have not. They have taken me one place to the on other, floor, right on top of the other. Left. Yeah, I loved what I saw. Okay. <laughs> um, we have a very diverse campus. I would say probably almost 50% of our students identify as black or African American, probably about 30% Hispanic. Mm -hmm. um, you did speak some about your work with the challenges that students face, but what specifically diversity-wise, what would make you a good fit here? Great. Given our level of diversity. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about where I center my work, and particularly at Portland Community College, where um, we've kind of centered all of our work. And first and foremost, we've centered ourselves in a place of um, the uh, a critical race theory lens. And what that means is critical race theory says that everything, that the basis of society, particularly American society, but the whole world, and all of the systems, including us as community colleges, um, have built up, have been built up um, with racism as a, a part of all of it. And the fact that we are working in and facilitating, and in some cases perpetuating systems that uh, are perpetuating a history of racism is something that I completely center my work on. 
And we have to continue to look at that and to break down um, the fact that, that unknowingly and maybe you know, subconsciously that there are systems of oppression that continue, including at this institution, I would, would say. I wouldn't even suggest. And so we have to come from that perspective. And you can see that also in the outcomes that come out. I mean, nationally, you know, average graduation rate, depending on how you cut it, 20 to 25% on the traditional measure, 7 to 10% for African American students. And so my passion, and as I talked about earlier uh, with the gentleman's question from the foundation, is about looking at that issue and looking at how to make sure what I'm doing is helping to break down that work, to help improve climate, and to also move forward with how to dramatically change how we operationalize and support um, tr tr particularly our most underserved students. So that's kind of where I center myself, and I do a great deal of work with that. And I also always acknowledge that I have to be in a state of continuous improvement and that I can perpetuate microaggressions and have unconscious biases that, that I need to always acknowledge and continue to grow from. And so I think the first step is doing that work and, and acknowledging that it's also about, about me and the work that I do. Um, you know, and the other thing that I will say is that um, I am a, a gay man and have also experienced being othered and have experienced fearing for my life and experienced a number of things that also don't match a perspective of anyone else and their experience, but gives me a perspective on a feeling that, um, that can't be, uh, you can't be told what that feels like. You experience it. So I, I hope that somewhat answers the question. It does. The last question I'll ask you is, where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> oh. Uh, well, I would hope that I would still be, if I got this role, in this role in five years. Um, I will say that, uh, personally, that I am getting older and big moves are about out of my system. Um, <laughs> and I would love to be back in the Northeast. Uh, I was in Pennsylvania. My partner grew up and lived in Pennsylvania, has a lot of family there. We have family and friends here. And um, frankly, being in Oregon so far away um, is not as easy as maybe I thought it would be. Uh, you know, my grandmother passed away while I was there, and it was so hard to get back and all of those things that happen. Um, so I really would love to be motivated to stay here for some time. And this could be a stopping place for me, um, you know, if, if you'll have me and if, if uh, you'll accept that while this position may be controversial, there may be benefits, and, and I could be the right fit for, for being able to be here in the long term and be dedicated to advocating and supporting you and your work and, and our students. Hi there. Hi. Maya Dreger, interim academic dean. So I have a question just more about like logistics and so forth. So this position is a... Uh, overseeing the five campuses, if you will, in the region, and there's no support staff for the position. And I'm just curious how, how you envision yourself, the model that you use for interacting with the campuses, the kind of presence you'll have, that type of thing. Yeah, great question. Um, and I've thought a lot about that, of course. And one, as I said earlier, I would make it a priority to be very visible and very present at all the campuses. Um, you know, for example, a conversation earlier, um, I don't know what the process would look like, but I would not want, um, unless this is what, you know, of course, the, the CSCU offices would want, to, to have a primary office and primary time in the statewide offices. I don't see that as the role in the position. I would want to be on campuses almost all the time or in the community and at events. Um, so I don't know that I need like a home base at all, as long as I have a space somewhere to plop down and, and have conversations and, and uh, be able to walk around at the colleges and get to know folks um, would be my priority. And that's exactly what I would see. One question, what I should have answered earlier, one question 
is that, um, you know, kind of what do I think my day would look like? And I went through it and it got really long because I think that's the idea that maybe I would go to two campuses a day and maybe I would go to two events that night that are, are in multiple areas represented by a couple of colleges. Um, and maybe I would need to go to a statewide meeting at lunch. Um, and so I would see it very much as me kind of always moving around because that's really, I think, the work. The work is making connections and really understanding from all of you and, again, being able to communicate back to you what it is we're talking about doing um, uh, from a statewide perspective and then take that back. So I think I would be moving around a whole lot. I think it, it's a big job, but it's doable. And, and again, I see how it's doable at, at the last two institutions I've been at that the college president does the work of making sure they are engaged and we are engaged throughout the entire community that, that we serve through the entire area that's represented and um, would, would do that work. Hi. Hi. I'm gonna, first I'm gonna try to explain a little bit of a scenario. Um, as I explained earlier, I, I, I'm on the Human Resources Department and as part of that, we're seen as that administrative um, branch that is looking to be uh, potentially merged or uh, more synergy so that we're doing things together. Mm -hmm. um, what I could tell you from my 15 years in this community college and in another one within the system is that since I've been here, um, I have had every attempt to try to do things strategically but because of the workload and more and more work gets placed on us. And the, the, the reason for that is there's agreements with the, the collective bargaining agreement. Something is, is negotiated, but they don't understand that you can't implement something like that really quickly. So there's a lot of back work. So in my 15 years, I found my work hasn't decreased, it's increased. But they're asking me to do more with less. And my concern is that the people that are going to get impacted are the employees, because that's my first interface. Yeah. While the student, we're here for the students, absolutely, but I'm here for the employee. My fear is how do I make sure that that message is relayed, and how do I become strategic when I, all I've been able to do is basically put out fires and basically get the work done, not even in, a, in, a, in a, an exceptional way, adequate because I just don't have the manpower <coughs> to do it. Um, and it's not because of that. My, my staff is great. Um, they work long hours. I work long hours. But it's just you don't have enough resources to get what you've got to get done. And now you're being asked to consolidate more. So the concern is, yes, can I do more with less? Yes, I can. But there's got to be some stuff that's centered and then some stuff that's superficial that might need to be revisited, either you know, re-engineered looked at a different way, or maybe even eliminated. Yeah. Is that stuff that you considered, and how do you see that play out in terms of our strategy, potential strategy for the college, for the region, for the system? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think, in many ways, you answered your question, which is we have to look at prioritiz prioritization related to what it is we're asking everyone to do. And is it perfect? Is it going to be easy? No and no. But we do have to start to say, you as the expert who's experiencing this every day, what are some things we have to think about differently? What are some things maybe we have to take off of your plate? What are, if there are any, what are efficiencies that could be created by thinking about standardization or centralization of some functions? But, but in all of that, that we can't lose the ability for each college to be able to have personal interaction, engagement, and outreach with someone who's going to be able to assist them and to, to have relationships with whomever that is. So uh, I, I, it's not a perfect answer because there isn't a perfect answer, but we have to really sit down and talk about what are all the things that we're doing. And ultimately, every time I've done that, there are things that we can think about doing differently. There are some things we could think about stopping and not doing. And uh, then there are other things that we really are going to have to do some hard work through and, and that can't maybe be resolved. But um, 
we can't say that until we've really taken the time to engage in deep conversations about how things could be different and maybe outside of the box that we're thinking now that could, could help in ways that, that we may not anticipate. Um, because again, I, I mean, both of my, pre my current and my previous institution, um, you know, human resources is centralized, but there are representatives that support all of the campuses and the functions. Um, and, and it can work, and it can create at least systematic efficiency. And, you know, for example, are we still, I hope not, but are we still using paper-based systems in, in, yeah, okay, well, I said I hope not, I shouldn't have, uh, that, that really, um, really efficiency can actually be created and savings in other ways through looking at completely electronic systems, for example. And um, you not having to kind of track through all of, all of those things. So there are opportunities. And, but it's something that, that I wouldn't come in and say, you know, we're gonna go paperless. It's something that we would talk about to understand what can help you do your job as, as effectively as possible to support all the employees. Uh, hi, I'm Marie Bache. I'm the director of the Academic Success Center. So um, one of the biggest fears, I think, with this consolidation is that we'll lose the community and community college. And so I'm wondering how you see yourself making sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, and I, I think that it's certainly been a theme as I, I read through um, some of the articles and then some of the questions today, that we have to continue to ensure, not, not allow, not um, think about, we have to ensure that each college retains individual culture and the ability to do things differently than other colleges and to continue to be the community college for the direct community that, that your college serves. And that wouldn't change. And again, being at institutions that are centralized and in some ways, um, the, the campuses are the key community focus for individual communities in which um, they serve. And uh, again, at Harrisburg, it was very similar that it was through kind of a, a rather large geographic area. And um, so each of those, those campuses really had um, very different ways of engaging with the community that worked for them. And so that should not change. Um, and really, it's how to support increasing the visibility and the advocacy for each of the colleges while also, so I put it second, while also looking at opportunities for collaboration amongst the region's colleges in initiatives and in other things as well as consolidation but only where it makes sense and not losing the personal touch even in those offices if they were even to be centralized statewide. How do we ensure that there's still a personalized approach to even providing those services on the campuses while also understanding that we could get some greater efficiencies out of doing that. But first and foremost, it's not to lose the community and community colleges. And I don't think that it will, based on the plan as I've read it um, and based on my experiences with these other institutions, it, it's, it literally can't happen. We're too passionate about our college to let it happen and um, wouldn't be a road that we would even want to go down on a, from a statewide perspective. It wouldn't even be feasible. Can I just follow up on what you were just saying? So with the regional um, environment that you've come from, curriculum-wise, are they still unique on the campuses? Or, or how, how does curriculum work? So if, if a campus wants to make an adaptive change very quickly to develop new curriculum, they have a local governance body, but in a regional environment where it goes up through this entire big structure, how, are, how do you, um, what, what's your experience with that in terms of being able to be responsive at the campus level? Yeah, so at both institutions we have single accreditation, which as you know in the conversations does mean that we have a completely aligned curriculum. And that curricular changes do go through a regional approval process. Now that's led by faculty working together from across all the colleges in the specific um, program areas that would be impacted. Now, I saw some questions too that of course, 
um, an individually specially accredited program that is only at one of the colleges would continue to have that accreditation. And I would say, um, you know, you would have to talk about if it made sense that, um, you know, even very similar programs that have separate independent accreditation beyond the regional accreditation process we would want to look at. But I do think there's a real benefit in beyond that looking at a more consistent curricular design for all of the colleges. Um, and I, I think I started out, yeah, by saying that 20% um, of students who graduate take um, classes at more than one of the institutions and that it is rather complex, as I looked at it, for the actual transfer process to occur. Um, and I know how transfer articulation works. I was a registrar once, and uh, it is not good for the student. <laughs> Uh, it, is, it is not streamlined. One would think we would have streamlined articulation across all institutions in the country, quite frankly. But uh, of course, that's not, not possible. But uh, it will be a hard process and a difficult conversation on exactly how to do that. But we, uh, in answer to your question, at, at my current institution and at the previous one, had um, the same curriculum, one catalog, and uh, one graduation processing and all of that. Not that we would do one graduation, but all of it is consistent from a curricular perspective. We're revising gen ed right now, and it's a fun time. Hi, um, my question is, uh, do you think institutional research function will central, be centralized? If yes, do you think it will impact college or, pro or program level accreditation or program review? So I don't know is the short answer. Um, I know that at one point it was mentioned as an area, and I don't believe it is currently on the list for uh, at least immediate conversation. So I don't know what the long-term conversations are, um, and so couldn't begin to kind of guess what that would say. And, and I'm imagining the reason it was removed from the list is because of the questions that you have related to um, the accreditation process and other standards and requirements. Um, so I'm not, I'm not close enough to it and again haven't had conversations around the specifics of planning to be able to, um, to know how strongly that may be being considered at this time. Um, so really can't. Very strong. Huh? Very strong. A very strong consideration? Okay. Oh okay. I'm sorry I thought that it had been removed from the list so um, okay, um, yeah, and so if, I would say if consolidation were to occur, that it wouldn't necessarily impact accreditation or program review, I think you said, or other requirements, that that, that office, one, would still have to be looking at college by college institutional resource information and the ability to provide the required reports, which actually in the example are quite consistent for the requirements that are going to be submitted for iPads and, and all of the standardized national and no doubt state reports that are required. So it's doable, but there still has to be a process by which we're making sure each college is getting the individual reports that are required and needed. And I would suggest even from a strategic um, you know, planning perspective that each college needs to continue to get specialized data beyond what, what may be required. But that can be done through, um, through one uh, one office if that's how it's moved forward. And, so, and again, I'm not close enough to it. If, if you're saying no and know something specifically about Connecticut that I don't, then, um, then certainly uh, I will, will happily withdraw my, uh, my assumptions. I'll let you get some water. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, Marsha Ball Davis, Interim Dean of Student Affairs. Um, what major changes do you see impacting student affairs um, as a result of the consolidation? Uh, yeah, again, I'm not uh, involved in the specifics, of course, at this point. But I um, would be very interested in having conversations just about um, planning for student support and student development and what, um, what opportunities there may be, for example, to implement a more unified technology that, that may help provide um, a better system for all students to be able to engage at the institution. 
um, looking at strategic enrollment management in general, both access and student success, and what we can all do to work together to collaborate and really have more of a collaborative conversation than specifics on what I would think of as consolidation or specific kind of changes or um, moves related to, to any of those areas. The only other one that I saw kind of on the list was financial aid that could have been earlier on directly impacted by consolidation. But again, I didn't see that in the latest iteration. But there are some opportunities there for conversation. And, and again, I live in, I've lived in a couple of environments where financial aid had kind of back office services that were more centralized, but still on the ground, direct student facing services that existed. Um, but beyond that, I don't really know enough specifics to be able to say. I'm not sure if, if I can help in another way. Okay, all right. I promise three to six months in, I will have those answers. <laughs> everybody kept looking at me like, all right. Yeah, everybody wants you to ask a question. <laughs> uh, but, but just in general, what's your, your leadership philosophy, right? I imagine that, that you studied leadership to be at the point that you're at in your, your career. And so, you know, there's kind of the, the personal, but what is your, uh, what is that grounded in from a theoretical perspective? Yeah. Uh, so it's a mixture of two. So I would say I'm a collaborative and disruptive change agent. And so as I've been talking about, I really am focused on making sure that I'm coming from a place of caring and support first and foremost. And so we're, we're we to work together, we're all of us to work together. What I want to do is make sure that I understand what your needs are to be able to understand how to help provide better support as time goes by. I'm not a magician, it won't happen in a day, but you will see me being a dedicated advocate for the colleges that I represent. And so I would be collaborative in making sure that, that I was really listening and learning and that I wasn't going in some direction without continuously doing checks on what it is that you're wanting to see out of a regional president as your leader. Um, but also disruptive because in a nice way, as you can tell hopefully, um, I'm also going to ask the questions about the status quo and about the fact that maybe we do feel like this has worked for 20 years and why would we change it? But maybe in those 20 years some things have happened and there are some opportunities for something that's different. And I want to help try to light a fire to understand what those things are and to understand how we can all be a part of being disruptive in our change and ultimately that's all about disrupting the status quo to better support our students. So for me it's both. We like disruption here. <laughs> <laughs> now we do. <laughs> I want to hear that story someday. Yeah. <laughs> Have I worn everyone out? Okay, quickly. Yeah. What advice would you give us here at Capital with everything that you've learned and have studied that's going on? So I would say, one, be open to um, the ideas and be open to the idea that not everything um, that, that's being presented is, is necessarily bad or don't go in. And, and I'm not hearing that that's what's happening. but. Um, really be open to, to ideas to think about things differently, but also be a continuous and fiery advocate for your college and what you think needs to happen for you. Keep doing both those things. And uh, if you can balance that, that's really the, the right place to sit, where you're, you're uncomfortable because things are happening that you're not 100% sure of, but that if something's getting ready to cross a line, then you're raising your hand and saying, we can't do this, this is unacceptable. But only do that if you feel like you have a really good picture of what 
um, of, of what's being proposed. And the way to do that is to make sure that, that leaders have opportunities for you to engage with them so you can feel comfortable that you have that. But, um, but th that would be my advice. Balance those two things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So